Okay, last week uh, we looked at some biblical passages uh, <clears throat> where the apostles at Jerusalem, uh, Peter, James, and John, encouraging the apostle Paul and Barnabas to remember the poor because they were going to go to the Gentiles and where they handled things amongst the Jews. <clears throat> remember the poor. Paul said, yeah, we're, we're, we're inclined that way for sure. So we looked at a lot of examples about how uh, Christians actually responded to uh, many urgent needs. They were admonished to be prepared to do that. <clears throat> One of the things that we saw maybe at the last is really when you get right down to it, the reason why he wants us to have that kind of concern and compassion for people is because that's what he does that's the very nature of God that's the very nature of the son of God now Romans 8 and 29 says those whom God foreknew he predestined they would be conformed to the image the character of his son that he Jesus would be the firstborn of many just like him <clears throat> because that is his character and that's to be our character as well now uh in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, it says that Jesus, in verse 35, went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. <clears throat> and now, of course, be careful what you pray for. Uh, he calls the twelve, and then he gives them power over unclean spirits, to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And then he sends them out. He tells them, now, as you go, I want you to preach, verse 7. Preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want you to heal the sick, cleanse lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely receive, freely give. And when you read your gospel accounts, that's what you see. Uh, Jesus could do those things. Now, they did not retain that. When they came back, they didn't have that. He would give it to them later, <clears throat> and they would take the message. Now, after his death, burial, and resurrection, right before his ascension, he would give them that power. They would retain it for the first century period of time, and, uh, and when they died, it went with them. Because the deal is, what this is telling us, and we see many examples in the scripture. All those physical deficits and weaknesses and problems in the area of sickness and disease and, dis and disability with people is mirrored or it's a parallel of a spiritual thing that you can't sometimes see. Oh, it becomes evident. Because Jesus said people got eyes, but they can't see. According to the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 6, they got ears, but they can't hear. <clears throat> now, he's not talking physically blind people and physically deaf people. He's talking about most people. Most people can't see and can't hear <clears throat> what God is saying, and they don't even care and they don't even look for the most part. But God wants our eyes open, and we'll, we'll be seeing that. He wants our ears open so we can live forever. We were dead in trespasses and sins, according to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, but he made you alive. When you were born again, you were separated. Previously, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us that man's sin and his iniquity separates him from God. God's arm is not short that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. But that's what happens when people sin against God. That's what the warning was in the Garden of Eden. 
God said, you can partake all the trees of the garden of Eden except for the one in the midst of the garden. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, the day you partake of that, you die. He told Adam that. Apparently, he communicated that well to Eve because she hadn't even been formed yet when God told Adam that. But then she was deceived. She was tricked. She would say, he tricked me, speaking of the deceiver. They did partake. Did God know that was going to happen? Of course he did. It needed to happen so we could get this thing going. Get this thing going. So when we come to maturity, physically in a sense, children are innocent, children are blameless, the Bible says, in the eyes of God. They have no knowledge of good or evil. Right and wrong, that's different. You can train a child to know right and wrong. You could teach a food dog that with a newspaper. The dog ain't supposed to be on the couch. Tell that dog, don't be getting on that couch. You come in, all of a sudden you hear this thump, and the dog is sitting by the couch looking real innocent. You go, are you on that couch? You go feel it, and it's warm. I told you, don't be getting out and get the newspaper. Does the dog really know right and wrong? No. But the idea is, children can be taught, and you should. Parents, raise up your children, teach your children, train the child in the way you should go. <laughs> yeah, you too. With the knowledge of good and evil. That comes with maturity. And when that happens, when the eyes open, sin revives, and we die. A lot of people don't know that. They have no idea. I didn't know. I wasn't, I never understood nothing like that. Didn't know God, didn't know the Bible, didn't know nothing. All I knew, driving down the road, I'm about 20 years old, three sheets in the wind, and I felt a sense of darkness around me. It was nighttime. It was a different kind of a darkness. I remember that, I'm, I'm telling you. I thought maybe it was almost a premonition. Like if I didn't get my act together, I was going to die. How true that was. And I wouldn't realize that till I was 30 years old and reading the Bible. The information was in the Bible. never knew that. The book was closed as far as I was concerned. I didn't know anything about it. But that's 40 years ago, and I'm not the same person anymore. Last week, I shared about some of the happenings going on uh, cause in the world because what we need to understand, what affects humans happens all over the world, including us right now. When Jesus saw those people that he had compassion for, they were wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. They were sick. They were weak. They were disabled. They were just lost. And he had compassion for them. And he wanted to send out his followers, specifically his apostles at the time. It translates all the way down to us today. He said, look at this harvest. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into that harvest. And next thing you know, he's sending them. And in the Great Commission now, it goes all the way down to us today. Go ye into all the world and preach this good news to everybody. Make disciples of the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Go ye. So last week, you know, I was sharing with you, getting his messages from Ukraine, Slava, who's the preacher there, you know, and he's got a pretty good work going on. He's, he, he's saying, we got to get some of the Christians out of Nicopole, man, you know, because of the rockets coming in here. We want to go out to the village, out where the drug rehab, drug and alcohol rehab is. You know, we could use some beds and some things to get them into a rented place. Uh, and then in Myanmar yesterday, I got a message from Burma. Uh, it's from Doc and P. Some of you might remember him. He visited here. That We've been there a few times. We help the folks there. Uh, we do the Bible studies uh, to encourage the people. Uh, but we also meet basic needs, urgent needs, uh, medicine. We've been supporting a clinic there for years. And Doc and P. says, how are you? We are safe right now under his protection. 
but all around them is fighting. There's a lot of troubles, he said. Uh, Thanks to your prayer for our country, uh, keep on praying for us to get peace soon. Now it's hard to go to school. It's hard to visit the churches. It's hard to find jobs to earn a living. The mission field is under fighting area, hard to live, hard to travel and have uh, fellowship and assembly services. We also remember you and praying for you to have peace. And that's just from yesterday. That fighting in Burma is still going on, been going on now for two years. And it's affecting them. It's affecting them in every way. But this thing, inflation, you've been hearing a lot about, is affecting everybody all over the world uh, for various reasons, including us. Well, what happens when a human being doesn't have their basic needs met? You know, Jesus said, you're going to have tribulation in the world. He said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars. Well, we we got that. Okay. Uh, There's going to be famine, and if they can't get that grain out of Ukraine, and I see now there's trouble again with that, there's going to be a lot of starving people in places like Africa because that's one of the breadbaskets of the world is Ukraine. Now, that grain can't get out of there. Okay, famine. There's going to be pestilence. Well, now there's a new variant. Hey, even the president's got it again. Okay, do we have? That's what a pestilence is. It's a pandemic. Well, we got plenty of pandemic going around, just like Jesus said. So that is the world, just like he said. He said that two thousand years ago. Jesus said that ain't the end. That's the beginning of sorrows. He said. It's the beginning of sorrows. I want to focus on what he says, that they're wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. That's really the biggest dysfunction of most people. You know, the very last verse in the book of Judges says, when there was no king in Israel, everybody did what? What was right in their own eyes. Hey, look, if you don't have a standard, if you don't have something bigger than yourself to look to, to get your counsel, your guidance, and I don't mean your jailhouse buddy. I mean, you know, if blind lead the blind, both fall in the ditch. We're not talking about other people that don't know what we're doing. But there has to be a sovereign. That is Almighty God. He is the creator of the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything that's in it. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. When Jesus saw these people, he really felt compassion for them because they had no guidance. And they need guidance. Now, nobody likes trouble or sufferings Wars or famine or illnesses and sicknesses and, you know, moth corrupting, moth and rust corrupting and thieves breaking in and stealing. People don't like that. But that is the world. And Jesus said, in the world you will have the tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have overcome it. And so will you. So what the people really need is guidance. Now, I'm just going to give you this in Luke 17. You're familiar with the ten lepers. These are ten miserable individuals right here, and they're crying out to Jesus because they know he's the go-to guy. In Luke 17, <clears throat> verse 11, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem, went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee and then he entered into a certain village and there met him ten men who were lepers they stood afar off they lifted up their voices and said Jesus master have mercy on us and when he saw them he said go show yourselves to the priest and so it was as they went they were cleansed now you know this leprosy is bad stuff dead while you're living, fingers falling off, and things like that. Now, according to the law of Moses, if you were healed of your leprosy, you had to go show yourself to the priest and offer a sacrifice. Okay, so that's, Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest, these ten lepers there. And as they went, they realized, hey, we're we're, we're healed. 
were cleansed. <clears throat> and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice he glorified God, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not found any to, who returned to give glory to God except this here foreigner? Then he told the guy, Rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where'd them nine go? Oh, I know. They went to the church building. They went to the synagogue, I'm sure. No. They went to the casino. They went to the, to the golf course. You know, a lot of people are miserable out there, but do they really want to be made well? Do they really want to be made whole? Or do they just want the problems to go away? Normally, that is the case. You know, I've been doing the humanitarian stuff in many places for years now, and I know that that many times is the situation. People are more miserable than you could even imagine. Right here, I don't have to go overseas. I mean, <laughs> right here. And they want God to fix it. Jesus said, no, it's about overcoming. It's about overcoming. I've overcome the world, and you will too. He wants to change us. He wants to renew us as new creations in Christ Jesus through a born-again process to change our very nature, to strengthen us with his spirit in the inner man, to give us his word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, that we are renewed through knowledge, it says, into the very image of the one who created us. Colossians 3 and verse 10. That's how God fixes us. That's how it's done. Those ten lepers, nine of them got what they came for, but they were not made whole. They got their leprosy cleansed. The Samaritan, who would be a, basically considered a dog by the Jews... He was made whole. He was made well. He was one. The only one that was made whole. You know, I like this. Uh, if any of you are, I mean, it's in John, the, the story in John chapter 5. It's about the paralyzed man who laid at the, at the pool for 38 years. If you're watching The Chosen, this is one of my favorite scenes. You know, I think uh, Dustin mentioned the brevity of the scripture this morning. And, and it is. You know, the Bible is not written emotionally. That's one of the proofs of its inspiration. 44 different authors, over 66 books. Uh, but it's the testimony of these inspired writers uh, who speak by the power of the Spirit, according to the scripture, that's the only way that these scriptures could have been controlled because what penman could have withheld his pen even on the mount of transfiguration when peter james and john went up there with the lord i think made reference to that uh they were there they saw it rick said with their own eyeballs and they heard that voice that said this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased hear him and they hit the deck but do you realize there's only like three or four or five verses of that record what penman could have withheld this pen if it wasn't for the holy spirit these dudes would have wrote and wrote and wrote and many other things if everything that jesus did the end of the gospel of john said if everything that jesus did was written down the earth itself couldn't contain the books that could be written amen that's the very last passage in the gospel of john uh there are many other things Jesus did. If they were written one by one, I suppose even the world itself couldn't contain the books. I am glad that the Holy Spirit controlled these guys. They gave us just the facts, ma'am. We got the facts. And what does it say about that guy laying at the pool? In John uh, 5, big John chapter 5, verse 5, there was a certain man there. Well, first I ought to back up and get the context. 
Verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now there was a certain man there who had infirmity of 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew he'd already been there in that condition a long time. So he asked the guy, you want to be made well? Uh, no, Lord, I kind of like it here. You know, I like laying here. I don't have to do much. They bring me a nice tea once in a while. And I don't have to, you know, work too hard. Or No. The sick man answered him and said, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. But when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another step down before me, Jesus said, Rise, take up your bed and walk. Immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, walked, and it was the Sabbath day. <clears throat> and that's pretty brief. You know, I know that uh, some of these that take a little bit of license, you know, to build a, a backstory. Every one of these people in the Bible had a backstory, they were real human beings. What a dramatic situation that this would have actually been to come up to a man that had been laying in that condition. I'll tell you what, I've seen a lot of paralyzed and beggars around the world, and I'm telling you what, that is some scary stuff. You talk about misery. Oh, man. This guy would have probably looked like that. So Jesus walks up, you know, in the movie, uh, tells the guy laying there, Shalom. Guy looks at him, Shalom. He said, you talking to me? <laughs> Jesus said, I have a question for you. That poor lame man says, well, I don't have too many answers, but uh, go ahead. So the question was, do you want to be made well. The man looked at Jesus because there's a crowd of these people, like it said. All these people, lame and blind and paralyzed, all laying there. <clears throat> when Jesus asked him, Do you want to be made well? He looked at him and said, Will you take me to the water? Because he couldn't get to the water. Every time he tried to get there, somebody stepped on him. <laughs> he couldn't get there fast enough. So, he asked Jesus, will you help me get in the water? Jesus said, no. But the question remains, Jesus said, do you want to be made well? And the man looked at him like, I can't get to the water. Every time I try, somebody else comes and gets in front of me and I can't get there. So Jesus squats down, looks him right in the face, and he said, I didn't ask you who was hindering you or who was helping you, who's in the way. The question is, do you want to be made well? He said, you know this doesn't work for you. You've been here a long time. And you know it doesn't work. Why are you still here? And you know, the reason why I like that so much, so many, we see it in the Bible. <clears throat> God is here to help us, to strengthen us, to make us well, to make us whole. But yet we sit there. We complain many times. We want it to go away. But yet we hear his voice. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made well? You know that everything you've been trying up to this point doesn't work. Why, he said, are you still here? He looked at the man, he said, now, take up your bed and go home. And that beggar looked at him all laying there and all dirty. 
And all of a sudden, you see his eyes change a little bit because he starts to reach down and feel his leg. He starts tapping his leg, and then he's like, starts to, uh, you know, like, wait a minute, what's happening here? He feels life in his legs. <coughs> and he stood up. Man, I would have loved to see him. That's what Scripture says. I'm not so sure it just went, hi, do you want to be made well? Take up your bed, go home, see you. <laughs> I think there would have been a whole lot more associated with that. Can you imagine that? Somebody laying there for 38 years in that filth, struggling, miserable. Woo, why can, how can God allow such darkness to exist all this time? <clears throat> because the light is greater than the darkness. That's why he can allow it. The light is greater than the darkness. These people were wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. Did they really want to be healed or did they want God to just fix their problems? Now he tells us in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus speaking, in Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 25, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or your body, what you're going to put on. Is not life more than Food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barn yet. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Now which of you, by worrying, can, can add one cubit to your stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you, Jesus said, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? After all these things the Gentiles seek. That's the people that don't know God. <clears throat> For your heavenly Father knows. He said he knows those things you have need of. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient unto the day is its own trouble. Man, that's encouraging. We're all up to our eyeballs in life and all kinds of stuff going on. We just already mentioned what's going on all around the world, including here. People are being crushed. They're just being flattened by the stuff they're going through down here. And the Lord is getting us, encouraging us, causing us to understand where our focus needs to be. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek his face. You get in that right relationship with God. You get that sovereign in your life. You follow that instruction, and you're going to see changes. Not only the transformation in your new birth, if you're born again of water and spirit, as the scripture says, repenting and being immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, so you can receive the gift of the spirit. So now like a babe, you can start all over from the milk of the word to the meat of the word, growing, but this time, this time, looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the teaching, he says, we must be taught by Jesus. And that's what the word is. That's why we have it. And this is programming for the human mind. It's amazing the changes that now can take place when you start living your life according to knowledge instead of flying by the seat of your pants. But how many people want to go through that process? You know, Jesus did say in Matthew chapter 16, if anyone wants to follow me, number one, they're going to have to deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. He said, look, if you seek to save your life as you know it, status quo, if you always did what you always did, or always do what you always did, you're going to always get what you always got. Status quo. We don't want status quo. I don't want my old life back. 
I don't want to be doing what was right in my own eyes. That's what the Proverbs says in Proverbs 14 and 12. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of the way is of death. That's a true statement. There's a principle in Scripture. It can't be broken. He says, you will reap what you sow. He says, if you sow to your flesh, you'll love the flesh, reap destruction. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll get what? Life and peace. Wow, well, that's a, what a choice, right? Hmm, do I want destruction or life and peace? Decisions, decisions. He said, well, look, okay, but here's part of the deal. This is the deal. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself. We need to get you out of the way. You had your chance, and it didn't work. <laughs> I'm like, I agree 100%. I'm speaking for myself. I did my best. I thought what was, what was right. It didn't work. I sowed the wind, and I reaped the whirlwind. And I know most of you, and I know you did too. Nothing new under the sun. This is what the good news is all about. Everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have been in that darkness. Priority number one, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and God will st he'll work in your life. You know, David said something. He said, you know what? I've been young, and I've been old, and I've never seen the children of God begging bread. Now, he just said something. You know, all these promises, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added. Your basics. He just said what it was. Food, clothing, what are we going to eat, what are we going to drink, what are we going to put on. He said, don't you think your father knows you have need today? Look at the sparrows. You ever seen a skinny sparrow? He said he feeds the sparrows. Clothe the grass of the field. Today he is. Tomorrow he's in the oven. Even Solomon in all his glory didn't look like some of these fields full of wildflowers. What's he trying to, you know, that's not Steve's promise. It's God's promise. And Jesus said scripture can't be broken. It also tells us not only in Titus 1, but in Hebrews 6, it's impossible for God to lie. And his word is truth. Test him in this. But be serious, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You guys know this is one of my favorite verses because when I was totally lost, I told you I picked up a Bible. I was reading the Bible, Matthew 11. You don't have to read very far in, in the book of Matthew. You know what? I did not start in the book of Genesis. You guys know that. If I would have picked up a Bible trying to figure out, never read a Bible, and I'm miserable, I'm below the basement, and nothing else is working for me, let me read a Bible. If I would have opened up like most people reading a book, you know, in Genesis, you know, right in the very beginning, I would have crashed and burned by Leviticus, man. And I would have said, they're right, you can't understand this stuff. I would have closed it up. But I didn't. I started in Matthew. You don't have to read very far. You know, I knew I was on to something by the Sermon on the Mount. No, that's only Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's right in the beginning, after you get past the genealogy, right? But Matthew 11 ain't very far in there. And boy, I hit Matthew chapter 11, and I see what Jesus is saying here. Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. Come to me, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You know what? I, I wasn't too sharp. I mean, I certainly was no theologian. But when I read that, I knew he was talking to me. Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden. I was laboring and I was heavy laden. I was being crushed under burdens I couldn't bear. Not only affecting my life, but then affecting the lives of my family. I didn't want that life no more. I didn't know what to do. What did he say? Well, then come and learn from me. Oh, wandering like sheep without a shepherd. Yeah, that was me. But he had compassion on me. Yeah, he wanted to help me with the basic needs, but he wanted to get restore my soul. 
Rest for the soul. That's what I wanted more than anything was rest for my soul. He said, you come and learn from me, and that's what you'll find. Rest for your soul. He said, my yoke is easy. There's a yoke. My burden is like, there's a burden. But with his help, it ain't nothing. It is nothing. So what did he say? Come learn from me. Guess what I did? I read the rest of the Bible. Read the rest of the Bible. That's a fact. You see, I needed guidance for my life, and he provides it. Man shall not live, Jesus said, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You got to read all that? Yeah, but you don't have to do it by tomorrow. You know, just a little bit. You eat every day. You feed the physical body, feed the, feed the inner man. Feed the inner man. We need it. You don't have to sit around and read your Bible all day long, but just figure this. I'll be, you going to eat for the rest of your life? I kind of figure we will. If you don't eat every day till the day you die, you're going to die sooner. How about a little bit of time every day? How about get up a little bit early? How about get 20, 30 minutes in? Start reading. Guess what? It'll radically change your lives. We've talked that these wandering around like sheep without a shepherd, they're in darkness. That's how the Bible describes it. The Apostle Paul said, before your conversion into Christ, he said, look, you're no longer, don't be walking like you did before. If you've been born again, he said, don't be walking like you did before. He said, no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in Ephesians chapter 4 and 17. In the futility of the mind, the understanding darkened, alienated or separated from the life of God because of what? Ignorance and because of the blindness of the heart. That's where you're at outside of Christ. You have no idea what you're doing. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, in verse 21, if you've heard him, if you've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word became flesh. This is the word. Still teaching people today. If you've heard him and been taught by him and the truth is in Jesus, you put off concerning the former conduct, what? The old man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on now the new man. The new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Wow, now that's a transformation. From darkness to light, from the power of God, or from the power of Satan to God. That's Acts 26. When Saul of Tarsus was blinded on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He goes, who are you, Lord? He was persecuting Christians, Saul of Tarsus. He was zealous for God. He was just going 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction. So the Lord blinded him on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Uh oh, what would you have me do, Lord? Look, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles in verse 17. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to open their eyes. I want you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and receive an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Blinded on the road, blinding light, Jesus was already in glory, already been here, already been crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended. And he stops this guy, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles, to us, to all the world. We need to go and open people's eyes. Do they want to be made whole? Well, you're going to find out. You need to have, we are to do good, we read last week, not all, to all men, especially those of the household of faith. We need to have the compassion that he had when you look and you see the people struggling in this world, like wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. Now, do they want things fixed? Do they? Yes, I'm sure. If they don't, you know, I know Anya was saying, said, we just wish these rockets would stop. They were praying to God that the rockets, the missiles would 
quit. She sent me a text the other day. She just started to send it. She said, the sirens are blowing. I hope that, well, I'm not going to read it to you. She was hoping that they didn't get killed. That's real-time stuff. But it's the same thing that's going on everywhere in one way or another. If people are outside of the will of God, they are lost. They're wandering around. They don't know what they're doing. And if they die like that, they're lost forever. God, Jesus said, I am a light that came into this world that people don't have to abide in darkness anymore. When was that said? 2,000 years ago. The light came into this world. Calling people out of the darkness and into the marvelous light 2,000 years ago. So the Great Commission is still in effect. Go ye and all the, preach the good news about how people can come out of darkness and into the marvelous light. How people can start over. How they can be redeemed, born again, purchased, bought, brought back, bought back into a right relationship with God. Now they got him working in their lives because sin separates people from God. That blind guy said, we know God don't hear the prayers of sinners, but if anyone be a worshiper of God and a doer of his will, him he hears. That's what the Bible's all about. But you've got to read that in from, you've got to see it for yourself. So when our efforts, whether at home or abroad, you know, we're getting our opportunities. Uh, you know, God willing, I'm getting back involved in what I was doing. You'll be in Kosovo in the middle of August. And I got the word last night that a guy named Liram, it's Alexandra's husband, is setting up some studies with people in the villages out there. Now remember, that's a Muslim Technically, culturally, a Muslim country, but they love Americans in Kosovo. <laughs> One of the few Muslim places in the world that loves Americans, but coast people in Kosovo do, because they thank America and Great Britain for saving them from the Serbian onslaught and the genocide. But they're not radicals anyway. There's a lot of mosques there, but they, I don't see anybody walk around with bomb vests or anything on, so it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, People don't even go to the mosque. Not too many, anyway. <laughs> I was with Jabba Duraco one time walking past the mosque, and the thing went off, the marionette. And I said, Jabba, what is that guy saying? I don't know, Mr. Steve. It's Arabic. <laughs> so they don't take it too seriously. But they're humans. And they did suffer a genocide. And their houses were burned for miles, and the women were assaulted. 23,000 by the count of the UN as a weapon. You think they need some light in that place after suffering so many things like that? Yes, they do. But now, like I said, Myanmar, Ukraine, America. It's a human condition, and uh, the cure to be made whole is the same message that's been preached for 2,000 years. But yet, few will find it, Jesus said. Why? Because many are not willing to deny self, take up the cross, and follow him. They want to be fixed. They don't like going through these bad things. God make it go away. It's not how it works. He wants to change you, strengthen you, so you can overcome it. And you'll like it. That's the whole idea. But some people, they think, ah, can we just avoid all that? Can't you just let me? Uh, no. So, in a way of encouragement, just wanted to share those things with you. Uh, we have the message of hope, and it's contained right here, but it needs to be taken. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send the laborers into that harvest. But be careful what you pray for, because he'll send you. Thank you for your attention this morning.